I want to point out to everybody before we begin, I am not an architect and I am not an engineer. Um, I simply work with them. Um, my background is, as uh, Vic said, in biology and environmental science. Um, and it really wasn't until I got out of graduate school until I figured out what I really wanted to do when I grew up, and that was make the world a better place, um, starting primarily with K-12 schools. I think that education and schools and the future of our youth is abundantly important. So while our firm does have other practice areas outside of K-12 schools, um, we do a great number of K-12 schools, and that really is where my passion lies. Grizzly Architects is a full-service architecture engineering firm. Um, just real quickly, we are about 200 employees. We have six offices um, between Northern Virginia and down to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we're a, a pretty big firm as far as um, AE firms go, if you don't count the, the mega monsters. Um, but even despite our, our relatively small size compared to some of those huge firms, we are ranked 11th nationwide for K-12 design. Um, and in fact, 55% of our practice is in K-12. And you can see there in the bottom right how many schools we have designed. So we have a lot of experience with these issues. And we feel really that it is our moral obligation to talk to our owners um, and talk to the clients at the school districts about the issue of sustainability um, and, and what the design process, what the construction process, and what the operation and maintenance can mean for the long-term health and viability of the school district. Um, as Vic mentioned as well, we do use the LEED Green Building Rating System in many cases uh, because that is probably the most robust framework that is available. And uh, many of our clients would like, to, they're going to spend the time and the effort in going through the steps. They want to make sure that they're doing something that, um, you know, across the country we can agree these are the important things we need to focus on, and this is the way we're going to measure our success. <clears throat> So over the years, I've been with Mosley Architects almost 15 years now, and we have developed a process, kind of a tried and true process, uh, to help us make sure that we're focusing on the things that are important. Um, so the first thing, how early do you start? Uh, we, we start at the very beginning, um, and, and my comments really can apply to new construction projects, to major renovation projects, um, but also to just general operations and maintenance. Any of these things that I'm talking about, you can start anywhere in that time spectrum. Um, but typically, we're brought in if a, a organization or if a school district wants to either build a new school or do a major renovation or an addition. So that's primarily where my experience is. Um, but no matter where you are and where you want to go, you have to start by being able to clearly articulate your goals. Um, and so I would often go into those very early design meetings and help our owners articulate those goals as they relate to sustainab sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, energy efficiency. That is a huge focus for architecture firms because that's one of the things that the owner can measure on the other end. Um, that also comes out of their pocketbook. If they're spending money um, on energy bills or on water bills, they're not able to spend those same dollars, obviously, on the educational mill. Uh, the educational mission of that facility. Um, we are going to have, obviously, for that reason, a big focus on energy efficiency, a big focus on water efficiency to connect. So over the years, just to let you know, the things that we can measure, we do measure. Um, and in our practice, our high performance building portfolio, as of last week when I finalized these slides, um, had water savings in our high performance buildings and in those buildings that we identified to have green environmental uh, strategies um, now save on an annual basis um, over 56 million gallons of water a year. That's through things like fixture selection, um, water source, things like that. Just, you know, making those choices up front, now these schools supposed to have what, you know, 20, 30, 40 year life cycle, as we know, they're more like 60, 70, 80, 100 year life cycles, saving that amount of money, saving the associated dollars year after year after year. Um, likewise, energy. I, hopefully you can tell that that's an energy number. I, <laughs> um, I had fun picking out these graphics. Um, 234,000 MBTU, that's millions of BTUs. Again, an annual number that's annual dollar savings year after year that these school districts are putting back in their pocket and hopefully redirecting into their educational programs. And then at the bottom, this is a one-time number, um, but even during design and construction, primarily during construction, you can have a lot of influence on even where the waste goes. And we have diverted in our high-performance portfolio that we're hoping that they reinvest in um, either their other facilities to make them healthier or in their educational mission. Um, we spend the bulk of our time right here with energy efficiency improvement.
improvements. Um, and we do that through things like understanding what our building envelopes are made of and how thermally efficient they are. Um, we want to make sure we keep the moisture out. We want to make sure we control how air gets in and out of that building. Um, so as architects, we would work very hard on that. For our um, energy systems, we want to make sure that we have the best performing uh, lowest energy using systems. And then we also want to influence the occupant behavior. Um, and Anissa was talking about one of our competitor schools this morning and talking about how they send signals to their occupants about how to modify their behavior. And that's something that I think you'll see a trend, hopefully, um, with architects that are paying attention to these things, is helping occupants understand what impact their actions make on the energy performance, but also um, the indoor environmental quality of their building. Things like even propping doors open, um, you know, here in this climate for about half of the school year, you know, in the beginning of the school year and the very end of the school year, it's typically hot and humid. Um, and just letting kids come in and out off the playground and keeping the doors propped open lets a lot of humidity into that building that's not supposed to be there. And that can lead to mold problems down the road. So just letting people know how to occupy, or how to occupy and behave in that building. So we spend a lot of this time worrying about things like energy and water, um, but then when you look at it through the lens of how much time we spend outdoors each day, this graphic is, by the way, 15 years old. Um, this was the cover of Architecture Magazine at the Millennium. So this was December 1999. Um, I don't think things have probably changed too much from then. Um, but that really begs the question, where are they spending the rest of their time? Um, and I think we probably all recognize that as adults, we probably spend too much time indoors. And certainly, our, our children are spending far too much time indoors in sedentary lifestyles, um, breathing air that could be more polluted than the outdoor air, depending on, on where that student lives. So we have a lot of energy performance targets. We have a lot of water performance targets. But can we set um, health performance targets, too? And I think you've heard today that um, really the, the science isn't fully developed yet, but it needs to be. And that's why I'm so encouraged by this gathering here. I'm usually talking to you know, facility planners, facility operators, um, and not necessarily uh, the sorts of people that maybe can help us set those health performance targets that then designers and facility planners um, can strive to achieve. So our goal is no more sick buildings, have healthy uh, learning environments for all of our students. So the things that we can do, the actions that we can take, um, one thing that we focus on as an architecture firm is material selection. Um, as you know, uh, anything that you put into a building, and especially those things that have odors, you're breathing. If you can smell it, you're breathing it. If you're breathing it, it's going into your lungs. If it goes into your lungs, it's in your blood. Five seconds later, I've heard. Um, but you know, anything that you put into the air by putting a surface in your building can impact your health, and certainly the health of the, the smaller people who are breathing faster and breathing more air volume and so forth. Um, so historically, and, and a lot of this comes from the LEED green building rating system, because that's the framework that points you to all the best in category for any of these different topic areas. Um, when we look at things that are wet that go into a building and that are going to dry, we want to make sure that they're the safest possible material that can do that job. Um, and so we do that by looking for these green labels. And so for things like adhesives and sealants, we would look for the South Coast Air Quality Management District guidelines having been met, which means they have lower volatile organic compounds in them. For things like paints and coatings, you already saw this green seal logo. Um, they do it for green cleaning, but they also have a logo for paints and coatings. So we want to make sure that we have green seal certified interior finishes. Um, in terms of carpets, carpets have been implicated historically in lots of sick building um, uh, lawsuits and so forth. But the carpet industry, I have to say, is probably one of the leaders in transforming how they make their materials, what they do with their materials at the end of their useful life. Um, and the Carpet and Rug Institute has put out several labeling programs to help people understand how safe their carpets are from an indoor air quality perspective. Um, so that Carpet and Rug Institute Green Label Plus is what we would look for. On that topic, do you feel carpet is an appropriate uh, surface for classrooms? Um, Personally, as a mother, I don't like to see carpets in my kids' classrooms, but um, in the schools we design, when our owners require that we do, we do. Um, I mean, ultimately, the district that's building the school has the final say of what goes into those classrooms, um, but we do talk about the indoor air quality implications and the maintenance implications if they want to go that route, um, and some still for other considerations, acoustics, um, 
warmth, you know, just the, the feel of the room, the ambiance of the room, they do want to have carpet materials in there. Um, and so we don't, you know, tell our clients you can't have what you want to have. We just try to guide those decisions and um, let them know all of the things that would concern us. Um, but yes, I, I definitely feel like there are times and places for carpets and in classrooms where there's tends to be a lot of spills and a lot of kids down there breathing that stuff might not be the best application. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, composite wood, something I really never gave a whole lot of thought to um, until I had discovered this career, um, is what goes into composite wood and um, a lot of the composite wood, the particle board that's inside the casework and so forth that's in our schools um, has a formaldehyde based binder and that is not a good thing. It can off gas for years. The urea formaldehyde can off gas. Um, I've heard some studies say up to 20 years and that's a carcinogen um, and it also can cause aggression and other problems. It's a neurotoxin. So we want to make sure that if we're putting those sorts of, um, you know, casework and cabinetry and things in a classroom space that we're not putting formaldehyde in with it so we would want formaldehyde free composite wood products um, and then any furnishings that we do put in there uh, green guard is another labeling um, entity they have a green guard for children in schools and so we typically encourage our owners to allow us to specify only furnishings that have gone through that certification process so that we know that they're not off-gassing the harmful pollutants now that was really the last decade the next decade looking forward is moving towards um, this notion called health product declarations, which is you need to write up, you know, all the things that could potentially have a health impact in your product and put that out there for the world to see so that uh, uh, companies, manufacturing companies are more transparent about what's in their materials because these labeling programs really only look for certain elements for the most part. And so, you know, you might be zeroing in on this, but there might still be something else over there. So um, moving forward and in the next version of LEED that you heard about this morning, LEED version 4, um, you'll see more of an emphasis on health product declarations that's very, very new to the industry. So probably we're all still going to be relying in great part on the eco labels until more and more products have these HPDs to go along with them. Um, but these are the sorts of things, no matter where you are, if it's a new construction, a major renovation, or if you just want to go back to a school building next week and say, let's, you know, look at what's in this building, you can look at these sorts of labels, you know, even for minor changes that are going into your building. Um, we also, during construction, take indoor air quality very seriously. This is not an issue that starts once the building is occupied. For us, this is something that we uh, require our contractor through the specifications and the contract documents to think about while they're building the building. And even if the building is not occupied during construction, we require them to treat it as though it were. Um, so we do require, uh, this was something that started with just our lead buildings, but it's been so well received that we actually require our contractors to write a construction indoor air quality management plan for just about all of our work. Unless an owner says, no, we don't want that, and really, who's going to say that? Um, we put this in our specifications. And so on the front end, we talk about things like you have to have an IAQ coordinator on the construction site. You have to have a phone number. You have to you know, talk about what records you're going to keep, what the lines of communication are. And then the guts of the plan really broken up into the five major categories you see there. Um, so we want to protect the materials while they're stored on site. For anyone that's been to a construction site, you know that they're not necessarily necessarily the cleanest places in the world. There's lots of mud, there's lots of dust, um, there's lots of stuff that just got thrown over there because nobody cared about it. Um, so we really put an emphasis on how materials and equipment are stored on the site. Um, we talk about, you know, which materials are most likely to cause an indoor air quality problem or what conditions and make sure that those things are remedied on a daily and weekly basis. Um, we look at the source control. What are those sources of pollution during the construction process and how can we eliminate those sources, number one? And if we can't eliminate those sources, then what do we do to just isolate them in one area of the building and not let them spread throughout during the construction process? Um, that leads into pathway interruption. If we know that we're gonna have something, you know, an epoxy floor has to go in over here and we know that's gonna be really stinky, um, how do we, you know, interrupt all the pathways where that air as that epoxy sets up um, could get into the rest of the building. Um, we do require them to have a housekeeping protocol during construction to keep
and the moisture under control. Um, and we have found that our buildings that do this tend to be much cleaner looking when you walk in. You, you really can tell which projects um, have specified this and which projects have not. And then finally, when the um, trades are installing the final finishes, we uh, try for the most part to get them to put in anything wet that has to dry before we put in anything fuzzy that could absorb those odors and re-emit them over time. So it's really just thinking through all of those things starting from day one um, and making sure that then when we turn the building over to the owner, we've either flushed it out with fresh air um, and we have set volumes of air that have to pass through a building. So it depends on the temperature and the humidity of what's outside, what that air handling unit can do. But we want to make sure a certain volume of air gets flushed out. So if there are any remaining pollutants, there's a better chance that the air, you know, those pollutants are removed. Um, the other thing we try to do when we can is have an indoor air quality testing agency come in and actually grab air samples at the end of construction before occupancy so that we can document at this point in time the construction process hadn't um, exceeded these thresholds. And then if there's an indoor air quality problem down the road, it might be easier to pinpoint, well, what has changed? Um, and we do have uh, two interesting stories about that. One, actually, um, it was in a correctional facility that we were doing because we do schools. We also do civic buildings and we do correctional facilities. Uh, but we had a construction indoor air quality management plan in place. And the entire time the building was under construction, um, there really were no odors associated with it. And at the very end, when they were cleaning up, someone brought in a, a cleaning supply that people smelled, and I kid you not, they shut down that construction job until they could get me the MSDS for the cleaning, you know, the, the cleaning chemical that they were using to see if it would be safe and if it would negate our entire LEED certification, um, which, you know, on, on one level was a little bit humorous, but on the other level, I mean, to think about an entire construction site shutting down because someone smelled an odor just goes to show how well that contractor had done for the you know, year and a half, two years that that building was under construction and how aware people were, hey, if I'm smelling this stuff, it's not good. Let's ask some questions. Um, so that that is one really, I think, hopeful story. Um, the other one, we were doing a K-12 school and unbeknownst to us, um, the day before they had the air quality testing company come in, um, some of the teachers had loaded some supplies into an art closet. And so, you know, the company came in and they grab all their air samples and they had um, two hits. One was there was too much dust still um, in an area around <clears throat> the stage where I guess some sanding had happened and they hadn't gotten all the dust out. But the other hit was at the supply closet where the colored construction paper had been placed. And the construction paper and the art supplies were putting off so many VOCs, they actually triggered the test. So the contractor required the school to take the supply out, you know, flushed it out for three days, retested, it was fine, and then it was up to the school to decide, you know, but it just goes to show you that, um, you know, these, the thresholds are very low and the things that we bring into these school buildings have the potential that we don't even realize um, to affect human health. So two things to think about there. Next, we talked about acoustics a little bit this morning. Um, and this is something that when it came up in lead for schools was really eye-opening, I think, for a lot of people. And as Anissa uh, mentioned, there are three different uh, concerns within acoustics and schools that we really focus on. One is the background noise, um, the noise of the air handling units and the fans, um, anything mechanical that keeps the air moving through the building and keeps us comfortable, um, that all makes noise. So we have to work very closely with our mechanical engineers and oftentimes an acoustics consultant to figure out, you know, where do you place the things that make noise? Do your light fixtures make noise? Do you have water pipes that are running overhead? Do you have a fan, an exhaust fan, a supply fan? The ductwork itself makes noise. Is the air handling unit on the roof is that, you know, reverberating down, um, vibrating down through the structure and causing noise. Because if there's all this background noise going on, the students aren't going to be able to hear and the teachers are going to strain their voices. Um, and so we have some, some health problems, you know, some health impacts from that and also some learning impacts from that. Um, we look at the reverberation time to make sure that there's not echoes or dead spots in the classroom. Um, and then we also look at the noise from classroom to classroom. Um, to save money, many times the partitions between the classrooms are either, you know, demountable partitions, which are very thin, or they're a lightweight block, and they only go up to the drop ceiling. So above that, it's all a big open space. So when the USGBC put out the guidelines for STC, uh, sound transmission coefficients, between classrooms, um, there was a lot of resistance because the cost to go to medium weight block um, and to go all the way to the deck with 
the, the partitions was so large in some cases that the, the school couldn't even be built if they were going to build it that uh, strictly. So the USGBC has been working with the K-12 you know, marketplace to understand these issues um, and to fix that. And they've adjusted the lead rating system so that some of these acoustical things must be dealt with in all lead for school buildings. Um, and then some of them are options if you can afford it or you're able to figure out how to you know, either you know, lower the distance between the roof so that you don't have to build so much. Some people do uh, jip board partitions up above the ceiling tile. And then also looking at what the ceiling tile is. Um, so if you have acoustics problems in your buildings, even if you're under an operations and maintenance phase, um, you can think about these things and, and look at, you know, what's going on with the HVAC, what's going on with the ceiling tile, are there, you know, other things that we could do to manage reverberation in the classroom, and then certainly looking at what are your partitions made of, and if, you know, if there's ways to make those better um, and to, to stop more noise, that would be something to think about. Um, daylight and views, uh, the whole notion of biophilia, um, it's, it's so important, I think, especially in schools, and this is something that we focus on extensively from an architectural perspective, is making sure that as many core learning spaces as humanly possible have access to natural daylight and access to views. Um, the threshold and lead for considering a space daylit is actually pretty high. So if someone says they have a daylit school and they met the lead threshold, that's very impressive. Um, some people also claim to have daylit schools just by having natural daylight in the classrooms. Um, this is a picture here of a school down in North Carolina. And the, the two light sources you see in the ceiling are actually not electric lights. Those are solar tubes, and they bring natural daylight into the classroom. So the way we set up this classroom, and this is one place where energy savings and indoor environmental quality really reinforce each other. Sometimes they're at odds, but in this case, they really reinforce each other because you can see we still have to put in all the fluorescent lights because there might be a storm. They might be using the school at night. Um, we have to be able to light the school. Um, but those two daylight sources, coupled with the large view window, we have a light shelf um, coming out from that window, and then we have daylight glazing above, which is clearer than the vision glazing. It bounces, the light bounces off the white surface on the light shelf, and then we've increased the reflectivity of our ceiling tile. Something as simple as the reflectivity of your ceiling tile, um, many people don't realize there's quite a range, and you can specify what that reflectivity is, and you want to get up over 85 to 90 percent reflective, you can bounce that daylight deep into that classroom and not have to turn your electric lights on, and then the students are also learning in natural full-spectrum light instead of under the flickering fluorescent lights that give us all headaches and, and make a space not quite as comfortable in which to live. And you can see all the casework back over there, and that's all made with wheat board instead of particle board. So it's an agricultural waste product that has an um, MDI binder, which does not have formaldehyde in it. MDI can be dangerous for the workers, and we have to trust that they have all their own protections in place. Um, it's hard to know how far back to go, um, but in terms of when it comes into the classroom, the understanding is that's a much safer material than having a formaldehyde-based particle board in those spaces. Um, we talked also about students tracking things in and out of the building this morning, and um, another thing we think about and is easy to retrofit into a school is looking at things like your entryway systems. Where are your high volume entrances and how can you capture the dirt and pollutants that are on people's shoes at that entrance instead of spread around a 100,000 or 300,000 square foot building? Um, if you have a 10 foot walk off system at your entryway, a good quality walk off system, research indicates that you can remove 80 or 90 percent of the pollutants on people's shoes in that 10-foot area. Now, of course, that has to be cleaned and maintained regularly, otherwise it becomes a source. Um, but that's something that we're actually now designing into buildings. But if you can't design it in and you want to do a retrofit, you can do rollout mats or other systems that can sit right above the finished floor, and you can still effectively capture those pollutants and keep them out of the building, keep them from being airborne and sucked into the mechanical system. Um, any space where chemical storage happens, janitor's closets, if you're in a high school and science labs, high volume copy spaces, if there's one copier where everybody does their printing and copying, um, we like to isolate those in their own room. So you could do an audit for an existing building or if you're doing a major renovation, make that some criteria that you isolate all of those spaces with deck to deck partitions or a hard lid ceiling, but then you also have to put independent exhaust to keep that space under negative pressure. And what that means is there's more air leaving that space than coming in, so it sucks the cleaner air from the building 
through that room as opposed to pushing the dirty air from that space into the building. So you want to make sure it stays under negative pressure. Um, and then finally, um, if you're doing a major renovation and overhauling your HVAC system, you know, make sure the engineers know that you want a very high quality filtration in that system. There's an energy trade-off there. And so if energy efficiency is a primary goal, you need to point out, well, let's make sure that we also have good indoor air quality. So putting filters, and there's these MERV ratings, minimum efficiency reporting value, and we specify MERV 13 <clears throat> or higher for our high performance buildings. And um, there's an anecdote here in a school where I was working with some of the teachers to help them understand their green features because they were working them into the curriculum. Um, they didn't know about a lot of these things that we did, like the MERV 13 filters, the you know isolation exhaust, the entryway systems. They didn't understand how that all went together. And she's at the end of our conversation, um, they, they were about two months into school. She goes, you know, I'm still on my first box of tissues in this classroom. It was a fourth grade classroom. She said, that's, I've never gone this long on one box of tissues. And so, of course, she immediately attributed it to everything we had did. I mean, it could have just been a year that illness didn't start spreading till you know, after that meeting. But I'd like to say that, you know, certainly we didn't hurt the indoor air quality of that building. And I like to think that all of our efforts contributed to that success story. So um, these are things that, you know, some of them can be done as retrofits and certainly uh, major renovations and new construction. So moving outside the building, I thought that this was a, a funny picture. I went to a job site to, to do a, just a field inspection, and it says, don't even think underlined of smoking in here. Um, but something that I discovered is that not all school grounds um, are tobacco free all the time. You can't smoke in the buildings, but there's not always guidelines regulating what you do outside the building. And so we've discovered this you know, through the lead rating system because that's a prerequisite that you cannot smoke or have tobacco, lit tobacco products within 25 feet of doors, fresh air intakes, or operable windows. Um, we've learned that there are school districts that either didn't have policies or the policy was you just couldn't smoke until you know, 4 o'clock, but then you could you know, stand outside and smoke at night and let the smoke get inside the building. Um, so we do work with our clients making sure that they have smoking policies and we also talk about idle policies in terms of you know where do we place our bus loops where do we place our parent drop off do we have something posted that says you must turn off your engine if you're parked here because the fresh air intake is right there um, so that's something certainly under operations and maintenance that you could still audit and make a policy change um, and help keep the exterior pollutants exterior and not let them get sucked into the building Integrated pest management, I know you all are going to hear all kinds of great things about this this afternoon, but this is something even as an architecture firm we get into. We look at this during construction, um, making sure as part of our indoor air quality management plan that we're keeping food sources and moisture sources limited so that we're not inviting pests into the building during construction. And then we also will work with uh, districts if they're interested in writing an integrated pest management plan that looks at um, preventing the pest programs, you know, having your infrastructure in place once you identify a potential pest program, and then having the protocols in place, you know, what chemicals are going to be allowed, what chemicals are not going to be allowed, how are we going to notify parents, um, you know, how long does the building have to be vacant. If you think that all through when you're not in a crisis situation, then when you get into the crisis situation, you can make much smarter choices. And I'm going to leave it at that because I know that I am not the expert on this in this room. <laughs> Inside the buildings with the green housekeeping, and we had a very good presentation on that already, um, the cleaning, pr or actually, let's start at the top. Um, number one, and this is the same as IPM, you know, when you're in a calm status, when you're not in a crisis or having a complaint situation, um, you know, look at what your different products are that you need to use or the, the classes of products and set criteria. Um, and Green Seal has some very good criteria. There are other labeling um, programs as well, but because most of our buildings use LEED, we default to what LEED defines as needing to be in these plans. Um, um, but we look and to find product standards for all of those categories. Also look at the equipment that's going to be used in your schools. You know, if, if floors need to be stripped and big equipment needs to be brought into the building and that has exhaust, um, 
look at all of those standards, you know, what kind of equipment is going to be accessible and what kind of acceptable and what kind of equipment is not. And then finally, um, set your cleaning procedures up to, you know, start high and go low using the microfiber, um, you know, understanding the differences between cleaners and disinfectants and things like that. So all of that will go into your plan. And then it's very easy if you have new employees, new housekeeping employees and so forth, um, to make sure that everybody gets the same message. And if you also get into an iffy situation, and you have a resource right there that you all have already agreed on. So that's something that is an you know, architecture firm we don't really have direct control over. But, you know, in our green building efforts, we try to think forward to what are you going to have to deal with when this building opens and try to set the building up nicely um, to move right into this for operations and maintenance. Um, mold prevention, I think we've talked a lot about mold prevention today, I probably don't need to belabor that point, um, but, you know, setting up a mold prevention plan, the um, IEQ uh, tools for schools, to, to get that all thought out so that you have a protocol for going around the building and making sure that you have good indoor air quality, have someone that's the point person who knows how to deal with issues um, and know what you're going to do in all of those different categories. So um, the EPA... This, this is the document that's referenced in LEED, and I, I have not found any more uh, current documents, so this might still be the, the governing document out there, but I think it's very thorough, and you can um, couple that with the IAQ tools for schools and uh, have a very effective plan. And then finally, we also talked a little bit earlier about the design for active occupants. Um, but in an effort to not promote a sedentary lifestyle, we're actually seeing a new emphasis on what architectural elements can we design into a building to encourage physical activity, to encourage movement throughout the building, to encourage spaces you know, to move from the classroom to somewhere else. And in our multi-story buildings, we're trying to make the stairs more beautiful, more engaging, more fun. You know lots of daylight, happy colors, um, you know, you, you obviously you have to have the elevators and they also have to be accessible, but that doesn't mean that the stairs have to be relegated to the very back, dark, scary corner. Um, so we are seeing a lot more, you know, celebration of the stair um, in an effort to get more people going up and down the stairs. Um, in elementary schools, you know, most of them are single store. We are seeing multi-story elementary schools, but when you get into middle and especially high school, sometimes you'll have three or four levels um, and in the urban areas, probably even more than that. Um, so we want to make that fun. And we even look at, you know, typing, you know, putting messages on the stairs to keep people encouraged to keep going up and, and have a pleasurable experience with that. So then to tie it all together, because these buildings don't exist just to exist, they exist to educate, um, what we hope very much is that if we've set everything up right in the building and on the site, we can then integrate all of these lessons into the curriculum. And this is where I get really excited and I go and I work directly with the principals and I work directly with the teaching staff to let them know <clears throat> how that building was designed or why it was renovated the way it was and how that relates to the things that they already by law have to teach. That's, that's the the main connection point, because if it's just one more thing to add on to their day, nobody's interested. But when I, you know, I, I live in Virginia, so I can pull out the SOLs and I can say, and, and this little, you know, very small chart at the bottom is actually, you know, volumes of Excel spreadsheets that say, you know, this is the SOL, this is the element in the building, um, and this is an idea for a lesson. Now, I'm not a curriculum development specialist, so I just kind of put that nugget out there, um, and I work with a curriculum development specialist, and they come up with lessons. And so this is a, a picture on the bottom here of a school we just uh, recently opened in Norfolk that's um, LEED Gold. And these are all of the different stations outside the building where they can study different environmental features. They've got some helical turbines that power exterior lights. They've got a rainwater collection system that they can use for irrigation. They've got pervious pavement. They've got solar hot water. So they can see all of these things and they can start to make connections to the real world, because this is their real world, and then they can take that into their adult lives. Inside, we also um, have lessons about the materials that we selected, um, the energy that's being used, the, the energy that's being saved, all of those things. So again, they grow up putting a higher value on indoor air quality, so then when they see the ceiling tile, like in the presentation before, they say that's not acceptable, you know, and they, they make a stink about it. And, you know, a bunch of students making a stink about something 
actually, I think sometimes might be more effective than a bunch of parents making a stink about something. Um, and then on the top, you can see there's pictures of dashboards, and you can put any information on here. And again, the things that you can measure are very easy to display. So you, you put your energy savings, you put your water, or your consumption, really, um, and then you let the students figure out how are they going to change behaviors at their school to lower those numbers, and then how does that relate to what they do at home, and what does that, you know, how does that relate to what they do in their adult lives? We also develop signage packages. Um, some of our schools, they kind of have like a scavenger hunt, you know, where the teacher will say, you know, you've got, we put a question on each of those placards that say, you know, this is the green feature, and then we put a question on there, and the teacher can use that as a springboard to talk about that topic. So sometimes, you know, green cleaning, sometimes recycled materials, sometimes, you know, whatever it is, that's all throughout the school, and those students are thinking about those things on a regular basis. And we work to integrate these issues um, not only into the math and science curriculum, but we look at, you know, things like public policy. You know, why, why do we deal with our resources the way we deal with them? Why do we allow certain chemicals to not even be tested, but you can put them in my school building, um, you know, so that the students, the light bulbs are going off and saying, yeah, why, why is that okay? Um, we try to integrate it into their computer skills. They make their own websites, um, do public speaking. They can present to the school board. They can present to parents to teach them about why their school is so special. And that gives them that ownership and that desire to keep that a nice place um, that other people also want to participate in. I'm nearing the end here, and I don't ever want to do all of this stuff and not know if it worked. Um, you know, what is, is the building really performing? So in Leeds, you have a lot of these, um, you know, action items, things that you have to do or criteria you're supposed to meet, but you don't really have any outcome measurement capability, um, and the USGBC is working very hard on that. Um, but one of the ways we like to measure outcomes is by issuing a post-occupancy survey. We give that building, you know, six months to a year for the operators to understand how it's operating. And this, again, is something that you can do at any point. It doesn't have to be only after a new construction project. In fact, it might be interesting if you're going to do a minor renovation or a major renovation to do a before and after to make sure you've you know, you've made a difference. But we ask things like, you know, how, how satisfied are you with the thermal comfort of your building? And, and give them an area where they can actually type in, you know, I sit in this space or this room is always freezing or whatever it is. Um, you know, where, where does the discomfort occur? When does it occur? Um, do you have visual access to daylight? Do you have visual access to views? Um, do you have enough views? All those sorts of things. So then we tally. There's, there's number scores, but then also the free form. So I just wanted to read off some of these that I thought um, you know, were really encouraging to me. Um, this is the most beautiful building ever. We hardly use the lights because of the fabulous window and glass. Um, so that's, that's nice feedback. The light available improves on the mood of students and teachers. These are all from K-12 surveys. Um, I've been healthier since teaching in this building than I ever have been in my life. Thank goodness. Um, I mean, I don't know that the building is the only reason for that, but I certainly like to know that the building didn't make that situation worse. I haven't had to take Zyrtec all last year. My sinus problems have improved since moving into this new space. And this is a variety of schools. This isn't all one school. Um, it doesn't smell like teens yet. <laughs> and then this last one, we, we also, um, students above third grade, we also include them in the surveys. And this was from a middle school. I can't listen to anything else besides my teacher talking. It's suffocating. <laughs> Success. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So that is. I mean, that's really an operations and maintenance issue. We do not design air fresheners, and right. Some school districts ban them. Yep. Under, well, under the uh, building design and construction, so remember Anissa was saying there's the, it was designed this way, it was constructed this way, stop. <laughs> and then how is it operated and maintained is a, is a whole different set of governing guidelines. And I don't know that fresheners are addressed in that set of guidelines either, but I will tell you that the awareness that these certifications bring, um, we actually have had clients call us, not from K-12, um, but from a, I think it was a courthouse or um, similar, it was a civic building, um, really upset 
because they had this nice new building that had, you know, exemplary indoor air quality, and one of her colleagues had brought in a scented candle, and she was furious, and she wanted to know if we could help make sure that, her, you know, we're completely out of it at this point, that, you know, that her colleague, you know, what kind of policy, what kind of research can we bring? So even just the awareness and the fact that that conversation was had, I think, you know, elevates all of this. Um, Correct. Yeah, that is correct. That could be a yes. And so anybody who is going to go back and write a green cleaning program for their school, um, make sure that you address fragrances and air fresheners. And if the building is designed correctly and it's operating correctly, there really should be no need other than just someone's psychological need to smell something like that. I don't, I don't know why. Is there another question? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just have a, a couple more slides of these post-occupancy things. This, uh, you know, we, we send our surveys out, but we also like to see what the press is saying about our buildings. Um, and this, uh, Anissa had mentioned Tim Cole this morning with Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and he certainly is quite the pioneer. And we did their first green building with them, first generation lead for school. In fact, I think this might have been the first lead school in the state of Virginia. Um, so it got a lot of press, and I just wanted to pull out a couple different quotes up there on the, I don't know what you call that tagline above the, um, the title block there. This was a fifth grade student said, it's a better place. It gives you more oxygen. So at least he knew something was going on. Um, the principal went on the record saying that she's been breathing easier in her new school. And in fact, a school board member for Virginia Beach City Public Schools stood up at a public meeting and said that her daughter who had suffered terribly from asthma in the school that this replaced um, and was using her inhaler daily, you know, the entirety of the school year, um, had not used her inhaler once at school. I think we were about six or eight months into the school year, just about the whole first school year in here. Um, and she stood up and publicly said that about her daughter. Um, and then also, you know, we have bike racks and things that encourage, you know, try to tie into safe routes to school. It's a little bit outside our scope, um, but we can put the bike racks there if the school district will then connect up with some safe infrastructure. Um, and I think this is the last one. When T.C. Williams opened, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, remember the Titans, right down the street in Alexandria. Um, that was the first lead gold building or high school, I think, in Virginia. And um, we did a lot of really, really neat things there, but we really focused on the indoor environmental quality. Now, in a building that size, um, three stories, you can't technically daylight it to lead standards. Um, but we had, I think when we calculated it out, it was above 80, 80 to 90 percent of the regularly occupied spaces had access to some level of natural daylight. And most of the classrooms were daylit. We did things with acoustics um, in the corridors. Instead of having the corridors be painted block, we actually put wainscoting on them so that we don't have to paint the corridors, except wainscoting is very expensive. So we were going to put the wainscoting up to like, you know, six feet because high school boys are very tall. But then they said, we can't afford afford that so there's not going to be any wainscoting and then um, someone hopefully me said well how high does the wainscoting really have to be you know like if your backpacks and the pens in your back pocket are only four feet could we afford four feet of wainscoting and we could and so when you go in there you'll see that above the wainscoting is painted but it doesn't have to re be repainted annually because it's not being as abused as the you know, the tile below. And so the entirety of the corridors does not have to be repainted every year. So there's a lot of VOCs that aren't going into that building. So it's things like that. Um, so, you know, we've got a um, student that said that last year they didn't have any windows in their classrooms. This year the student can focus in the paper. Nobody paid her to say that. Um, <laughs> They say they, um, they, the reporter wrote that the kids can't doze in class anymore because sunlight pours in from practically every angle. And in some classrooms, that really is true. Some of the corner classrooms have glass almost all the way around. Um, one of the students complained because the bright lights keep you awake. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, and then I also thought this, this is kind of just ancillary to what we did, but they said the greenness of the campus has heightened their shame over vandalizing the building. Now, I haven't been in there in the last couple of years, but I know for the first few years that building stayed very, very clean. Um, 
and I'm hoping it's still beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I need to get back um, and take a walk around because it has been a few years since I've been inside. Um, but those are the sorts of things. They kind of start a ripple effect, and, and more and more schools, the, you know, the competing school districts around say, well, we've got to do that too. And so just by talking about these things um, and by bringing these issues to the forefront and getting them written up in the Washington Post um, really heightens that dialogue and, and makes a lot of change. So with that, I will hush, and um, we can, I know we had a question over here, and then we'll go over here. What kind of materials do you recommend as an alternative if you still have the requirement that you need kind of a soft, warm, cushy, but you can still clean it well? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have an adequate answer to that. It's a, it's a really tough question. I mean, I will say the, the carpet industry has come a long way, um, and so I think that the carpet material itself upon new installation, or if it's a, you know, just a throw rug, an area rug, um, probably is much safer than it was 20 years ago. I'm not going to say that it's completely safe, um, but they're much lower odor. And um, I know a lot of the very concerning chemicals have been phased out of that manufacturing process. Um, but the operations and maintenance end of it, you know, keeping it clean, making sure that it's being vacuumed properly, um, you know, that's, that's hard to tackle, especially if you have a cleaning staff that's turning over or that doesn't understand those protocols. Um, now, one thing we do like is the um, carpet tiles, like what you see in here, because if there is a spill or, you know, someone throws up in the classroom or whatever happens, you can remove those tiles and put new tiles in. And with the patterns that we design or, you know, that the, the carpet industry really, um, you know, you just kind of put it in and, and you, you can hardly see the seams because there's so much other patterning going on and you could have an old tile and a new tile next to each other. Um, and unless one's really, really old, you're not really going to notice that. Um, so moving to the carpet tiles is good. Um, I know natural linoleum is something that's often promoted. Um, some people are sensitive to linseed oil off gases for a long time. Um, and so if you have a sensitive population, linoleum might not be the best because of that sensitivity of the linseed oil. But it is naturally, I understand, antimicrobial. Um, and so it's, it's a safe product and it's, it's soft, not as soft as carpet, but it's softer probably than VCT. Um, you know, and then there's cork. You could look at a cork floor. Um, and, but you got to make sure it has a good finish on it, of course, because it's porous as well. But it's also very expensive. Um, so, you know, your best bet might be just to have the area rugs and just replace them, you know, every year. <laughs> uh huh. Have you ever seen any type of like a rubberized flooring used, almost similar to what they use on outdoor playgrounds? Yeah, so you have to be really careful with that, too, um, because, number one, the, the rubber does off-gas for a long time. We actually, in our office um, in Richmond, if any of you are ever there, come to our office, because what we wanted to do is make it a living laboratory of different finished materials. It's a lead platinum building. It's a renovation of a historic building that actually, um, we were talking this morning about the old industrial warehouse um, mechanic shop. That's actually... I was like, oh, no, <laughs> what didn't I test for? Um, but we renovated it, and we've put as many different finished materials around the building as we possibly could. And in one area, we were going to have a little fitness room. The economy crashed. We never bought all the weights, but the room is still there. And we put a rubber floor in there. That is the only space in our building that you can smell. When you walk in there, it's off-gassing. And also, there's not necessarily a lot of quality control about the rubber if you get a recycled rubber product. Um, so if it was a car tire, it could have a lot of um, pollutants and, you know, heavy metals and things on the car tire, and then also the, um, the carbon black, that, the dust that comes off of it. So at the moment, I'm not a very big fan of those rubber floor products. I think you'd want to really look at that closely. Okay, back here. <laughs> Uh -huh. I actually hear architect law, and I want to debunk this, that somehow carpet tile is the solution to carpet in classrooms because it's not. Uh, because 
carpet tile is just as, as hard to clean. And yeah. um, sure, you might get a spill on it, but you get enough spills on it that you eventually swap out all your tiles mm -hmm. and all your, your clean tiles are all stained. So it does nothing to make carpet any easier to clean. So I, I just want to point that out. Um, my real question is about, um, we see in uh, a lot of schools in the summertime, they tend to shut down the HVAC systems. Mm -hmm. And um, from an energy perspective, there's a real drive for that, right? There's no one in the building, shut it down, and then the classrooms just are a sink for moisture. And if you've ever been in a school and you start to see the ceiling tiles have these, these sort of like undulation, basically a couple summers of sucking in a lot of moisture and then taking all that moisture out during the school year. And so do you work with any of your schools specifically on maintaining um, those uh, key environmental you know, set points even over the summer? We, yeah, I mean, when we do a project and we turn it over to them, we have a process and we go through the commissioning and make sure that the training happens so that they understand what all the different settings for the building automation system would be. So there would be a summer setback, but it would be programmed to maintain the humidity control. Um, you know, unfortunately, once we turn the building over, we have very little control until we hear there's a problem and then we have to go figure what, you know, what was the series of events that led to this problem and was it related to the design or was it related to, you know, someone turning it completely off to save energy. Um, but we do try to do that education um, and, and hope that, you know, as the facility managers turn over over time, they all truly understand how to operate that building. But especially in the southeast where it's so humid in the summers, that's a big problem. Um, you know, because the buildings are being set way, way back. And you go in and in August when the teachers go to bring their, you know, open their rooms back up, you can feel the moisture in the air and that's not good. I think we had, we had one here and then oh, <laughs> we've got people everywhere. Hey, you decide who goes next. <laughs> that's too stressful for me. <laughs> that's a great talk. I really oh, thank appreciate you. what you do and sort of the interventions that you're sort of We're trying across the country. It's terrific. Um, I had a related question to, um, to what and just stated it. I was wondering if through LEED, are there any requirements for um, periodic assessment of indoor air quality or noise or any of the issues that you outlined for us? Oh, and I'm, I'm not a LEED existing buildings expert. There's, I mean, obviously, at the end of design and construction, um, there's not. You know, we assess many of those things during design and construction, but then once the school district takes over in operations and maintenance, um, I'm, you know, we're not as heavily involved. Do we have any LEED EB experts in here? I wish Anissa was still in here. Are you... <laughs> yeah, Lead EB does require like a green cleaning suite. There's six points available, I believe, for a cleaning so that there's a whole system that's required. Uh, they have, you have to do a post occupancy or a, you have to do a, um, a survey like uh, was mentioned here, an occupancy survey. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know, uh, many more of the occupational sort of and operational conditions of the building are required for a lead EB. So it does get covered in that so way. So some of those things are prerequisites and you have to do them. Like you have to have the policies in place. The policies, but the actions you get. Those are the optional for, points. Yeah, so you decide. You get points for being uh, able to be uh, uh, go to the building and arrive there in a uh, alternative transportation. Um, there are many, many good features of set points and, and um, uh, building automation system to control outdoor versus indoor air flow that are required. So. Yeah, so um, I think it touches on it. Um, hopefully, they'll continue to develop that and um, make that even more explicit in terms of lead being a list of things you should do these things without having the testing, the measurable outcome on the back end. And so that's something that I know that USGBC is working very hard on those measurable outcomes and especially trying to figure out in this health world, you know, the health realm, because the science isn't there yet to know how do you draw that line in the sign, how do you man it, you know, how do you measure it and all of that. Um, I was interested in learning about how you work with an educator to then turn the building over to the school staff and use it as an educational backdrop for uh, the students and the staff. My experience is that they get the keys and right. the architect says, good luck and enjoy your building and nobody knows anything about the features of their building. So that, that kind of model of how, how you bring the educator in at some point during mm -hmm. the construction 
or the end of construction mm -hmm. to sort of think about this is interesting to me. I wish lead, if one is building a lead building, actually required that as part of school's work. But right. Well, that's in the future. lead for schools does address it with their school as a teaching tool. It's an optional point. Um, but yeah, very optional. It's one that when we do a school, we always try to pursue um, again. And we don't have all the control. I mean, our clients are the ones who own the buildings, but we do invite or always encourage um, the principal and or some teaching staff to be on that building committee from day one. And when I'm in the room, we talk about how, you know, what we're doing in design can be linked to what they're doing in the classroom. Um, if we develop a, a good enough relationship and the momentum is still there, a lot of times the principals change too when the building opens again. And that's really tough. Um, but I will continue to work with the principal who will connect me with either the lead teacher, if it's an elementary school, or a curriculum development specialist. And then I'll just go have a meeting with that person and get them really excited. And then in some cases, like the school in Norfolk Crossroads, um, they actually brought, they had three of the teachers planning days dedicated to developing this curriculum. And they had me come in. I gave a presentation to all of the teachers about what we did and so forth. Um, and then I worked directly with them. You know, I kind of gave them the springboard. These are the things I see could be done. And they say, well, these are the things we have been working on or really excited about in this community. And we kind of mush it all together. And then we can turn that into the USGBC and say, look, there's 10 hours at minimum of curriculum for every student in every grade, every school year. Um, and, and that's how we do it. And there's not many architecture firms that are doing that, but there are some of us. I'm not the only one that does that. Um, I'd like to be, but um, I'm, I'm glad others are working on that too, because it's a really important component. You know, I'd like to piggyback on what Lorna and I think Andrew was saying. You know, uh, we had a school where when, when summer occurred, when summer came, this, this school district, uh, we closed down the, uh, the rooms, but not the air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. And within about two weeks, it was a very hot summer, the air conditioning system running full bore ended up chilling the room so much, moisture and condensation occurred, and there was about 10,000 square feet of mold on a whole bunch of surfaces. And so I think that the, the kind of lesson is what Lauren is talking about and Andrew, on both ends, it needs some understanding of the building systems and operations. Yes. So here it costs, you know, $100,000 that we probably didn't need to spend. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be the same case on this other side. So I think it's just knowing how the systems work. Correct. What they do. Yeah, I mean, the, you, you need a good facility operator. You need someone who's educated, who understands how moisture moves through a building, who understands how mechanical systems work. Um, and that person needs to be present and aware of what's going on in that building. And it's hard when you close a building for three months and don't really have anyone there. No one sees these things starting to